Welcome everyone to the meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny, Environment, Communities and Partnerships. Thank you everyone for their attendance. Let's start with the agenda. Have we got apologies? Uh, yes. Councillor McAdam and Councillor Lowe. Thank you. Let's move on to item one, minutes. Is everyone happy that they, the minutes you've received in the pack are correct? Minutes from um, last month? Yes, thank you. So moving on to item two, members' interest. Has anyone got a declaration, um, either um, pecuniary or other interest, in the um, coming agenda items? Um, Councillor Albain. Here we go. Thank you, Chair. I, I don't think it's, a, it's going to be a, an interest, but just to be on the, the safe side, my daughter, who doesn't live in the same house as me, is works for the NHS and deals with um, health and well-being issues dealing with the education service. So there might be a little bit of overlap. There's no pecuniary interest, but I'd rather mention it and, and be safe than, if you pardon the pun, and then, then be sorry later on. Thank you, Councillor Albane. Would you need to step out? No. Thank you. So moving on to agenda item three, notice of key executive decisions. Has everyone had a chance to look at the plan and there any comments on the decisions? None? Thank you. Then we'll move on to item four, the adoption of the updated HDC safeguarding children, young people and adults at risk of harm policy. I believe Peter is going to give us a review of the um, policy that we've all read yes. from the pack. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, as per the executive summary, this is a um, review of our current existing um, safeguarding policy. We've worked with partners through the Independent Safeguarding Partnership Board um, to adopt a corporate template across our um, the three count the four councils that we work with. This is just an update to our existing policy, so no material changes to guidance that we offer to staff um, in relation to reporting and recording procedures. I don't know whether it's the right place to have. I had one question um, that um, was in reference to uh, the clinical commissioning group being referenced in the document. Obviously, people are aware that the clinical commissioning group is no longer a um, around in um, Cambridgeshire, it is now the integrated care system. Where I've referenced it is within the key legislation for safeguarding of children, and that piece of legislation is still the working together for safeguarding of children in 2018. So it is referenced. What I've done is put a um, reference, highlighted reference for staff saying that for Huntingdonshire, this is now the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough integrated care system. Thank you. I'm um, Councillor Albain. Thank you, Chair. On page 32, 2.2D, it re uh, makes reference to members, and em employees and volunteers and contractors receive appropriate training. This, is, this has come a quite opportune time. I'm a member of the Member Development Working Group and we were looking at member training and I, th I think this is an in important part to include in, in, in member training so that we're all aware of our, our responsibilities. Thank you, Councillor Albain. On the back of that, have you got an idea of what the training will look like and for a members? Yep, yeah, we've got um, three levels of training. Uh, the existing e-learning training that we do um, at induction and as a refresher, there is then the basic face-to-face -face training, which is the minimum standard for 
anyone working directly or indirectly within this area. And then our third level is for DSOs, our designated safeguarding officers who deal with the um, uh, reports or any um, information coming through. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Councillor Burke. Thank you, Chair. Um, 15.2, um, around hiring of facilities. Um, it's great to see that this has been considered. There's just a couple of points that I want to pick up. There's, it says agreement to work within the expectations of the council's safeguarding policy, unless the event organiser has its own. Is that not standard that if an event is happening, they should have their own safeguarding policy? Yes, and I probably should say you would hope so. Um, however, that's where that line is generally in for hirers, that they will comply with our policy as a minimum. But if they've got their own, that's another level of reassurance that we would always expect to have. I guess it's, it's just around the wording of that then, because it's an agreement to work within the expectations unless they have their own. If, if, we're, if we're allowing, let, let's say somebody's using a park for something, um, they're going to adopt some sort of safeguarding policy. How does our policy cover them as an organization? I'm, I'm I guess I'm getting hung up a little bit on the word unless, because actually would it not be that they have to have their own policy to you? From, from a safety advisory point of view, and having gone through that process loads of times, we have to provide one. It's not, well, we as a council have one, so don't worry about yours. We have to provide our own. So I guess it's just the wording. I'm happy to adjust the wording. That's not, not a problem at all. But it, it's the word unless is there for the catch-all so that we have that facility that if they don't have one, they, we can still look at their hire, depending on what the hire involves, um, but then they are expected to comply with ours. This, the, the wording does go back to a long time where there were sporting organisations who had not gone through safeguarding um, reviews where they didn't have their own policies. They're sm small clubs, small things, like, small things like that. That's where that unless comes into it from there, but I'm happy to, to look at that. I can speak now. Um, the next point in 15.2, in um, it says a requirement that staff who will have significant unsupervised involvement with children and young people. Um, there's a couple of points in there is what does significant mean? Because we're, we're kind of opening ourselves up straight away to question um, and the other point is we need to include in there about adults as well that's missing and I'm saying all these things as someone that's written a safeguarding policy so many times so I'm just picking out really yeah. detailed bits but no I'm, I'm fine I'm more than happy to take those on board the significant unsupervised involvement is generally the statement that relates to regulated act it, the smaller level of regulated activity. Um, so I can I can adopt that word in there. Yeah. Councillor Hassel. Councillor Hassel. I'll, I'll, I'll go with you, uh, Councillor Shaw afterwards. Yeah, I, I just wanted to offer my apologies. I've been, <laughs> been outside. My, uh, my pass doesn't open the door, so I had to go and uh, so I thought otherwise I would have introduced this item, but uh, I'm sure uh, Pete's done an able job. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Um, my question's um, regarding section 9.2, the log of concerns form. Um, it stipulates in their log concerns form is available for all employees, councillors, volunteers and agency staff to make a record of any kind of concern. Now I'm strictly speaking a 
employee of the council, um, but the log of concern form is on a, a Microsoft SharePoint and we don't have access to that. So can there be another sort of link to the, that file, perhaps? Yes. <laughs> Get in there. Councillor Bywater. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Just on a quick issue regarding getting into the building, this is a public meeting, surely, so shouldn't there be access to the public? I'm just thinking if members of the public turn up, they can't get in. So uh, just so we can uh, nip that in the bud. Um, yeah, very good report. Uh, I do like the flow chart. I think, you know, it's very simplistic. Um, having been a member of the um, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Safeguarding Board, um, you know, I think this is very useful. Uh, you know, as it says in the document, safeguarding is everybody's responsibility. Um, just a quick question, because I know the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Safeguarding Partnership Board, as it's now called, does, does, H, does this district have a representative on that board? And who is that then? Yes, uh, it was Joe Lancaster, so it will be um, Ollie in, in, in go for it. Yeah, yeah. Has anyone got further comments or questions? Councillor Orban. Thank you, John. 14, page 43, photography and media. Um, having been involved in running youth football teams, and, and as a parent, it's not unusual for, for parents to, and grandparents to turn up and brothers and sisters, particularly now since my kids are involved in youth football, the, ad, the advent of good quality phone, phone footage has become far more widespread. Do we have any specific policy on on filming within council premises, um, on council sports fields? The specific policies that I, I am aware of is, is primarily the, what the one leisure sites where they have it within all of their booking forms for parties and also when they are doing bookings in and around the facilities, they display the notification and that that, that is going on and what they were used for. Um, any other comments or questions? I'd like to thank you, Peter, for your um, answering the questions. And personally, I found the policy very well written and very thorough. I was very impressed by it. So is everyone happy for... Oh. I was going to politely say thank you. That, that was all I wanted to do. I'd take the credit for the, um, the, the, the number of people that have gone, got, been involved in this. Thank you. So if, no, if there's no further comments, are we happy for these, our comments to be passed on to the um, Cabinet? OK. Oh, Councillor Albain. Councillor Burke in particular made some, some relevant points just to make sure that everything that was mentioned will, will go forward to Cabinet and be picked up. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, that's my phone ringing. Thank, thank you, Peter. So we'll move on to item five, Homes for Ukraine scheme. Um, Becky's just got to make a note on this. Uh, so just while we're waiting for the officer to, to come to the table. Um, it was just a note that we, we'd noticed an administrative error within the report once the agenda had been published in that the recommendation should state that the overview and scrutiny panel is invited to comment on the Homes for Ukraine scheme um, and the presentation is to be made to the panel and it's not the warm spaces um, which is on there. So and unfortunately that's an administrative error. So uh, just to correct that and obviously we'll make a note of that in the minutes as well. Um, and then the officer is, is Caroline Hudson. Thank you, Caroline. Um, Caroline will present to us um, 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 some more information about the report. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak this evening. So um, I've been coordinating the Homes for Ukraine scheme since it opened on the 14th of March last year. Um, if we can start the PowerPoint, that would be fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> So although the government set up the scheme and produced the, the foundry system, which is a system that records all of the visa applications and also allows us to record checks and all of the, the requirements in terms of sponsors and guests, um, it was really down to each local council to decide how the scheme should successfully run in each district. So um, myself and other members of the team decided uh, what we wanted to do to make sure that it ran as a success in Huntingdonshire. Um, every district obviously has different barriers, problems uh, and ways to support. Uh, we're, for example, very different to a district in the central London. Uh, we're also very different to South, uh, to South Cambridgeshire District Council, who at one point had the second highest number of Ukrainian uh, guests arrive in the whole country. Um, we had issues like we've got some very rural areas, so making sure that our guests were able to access transport, that was one of our big issues. Um, so just to give you an idea that we had to work out the best way to run the scheme for our district and the location that we live in. Um, so, sorry, I've never done this before, I've made loads of notes. <laughs> So in Huntingdonshire, we've tried to ensure that there was firstly no barriers in the Ukrainian guests getting here, that our checks weren't holding anybody up, and that they were able to get here as quickly as humanly possible once they received their permission to travel letters. Um, we decided that um, we would communicate really early on with our sponsors. So from the day they arrived in the foundry system, I would make contact with them. We'd make sure that their checks were initiated. So we'd do their DBS checks. We'd make sure that their home check was done and that everything was in place, ready to welcome the guests. Uh, we also made sure that the £200 subsistence payment was made as soon as humanly possible after they arrived. It was, it's actually a really, really important part of the program because although some people arrived with money, lots of people didn't. And being able to access especially personal items that they might have been embarrassed to ask for, it was really important to get that cash to them quickly so that they were able to purchase whatever they needed. And uh, following up from that, the welfare visit. So the welfare visit is a visit that um, I do within a week or 10 days of them arriving, and that's a visit to ensure they have absolutely everything that they need to make sure that um, they are able to access universal credit, that their children have made the applications for school. You know, all of those things that you have to do when you're settling into a new country, that the sponsors also took great responsibility in making sure was done. It was, it's just another layer to make sure that everything they needed, they knew about and nothing was forgotten. And then the ongoing support assured for guests and also for their sponsors. It was really important to make sure that our sponsors and continues to be that our sponsors are really well taken care of because they're the key to the whole, the whole process working. So it was very, very labor intensive in the beginning. Um, lots and lots of paperwork. Um, it's very labor intensive also for the sponsors, as you can imagine, applying for schools, applying for universal credit, child benefit, all of these things in, you know, induce a huge amount of paperwork that sponsors generally weren't prepared for. Um, so offering support for that was really, really important. School applications was probably the thing that brought up um, the most issue, I think the school system weren't prepared for the amount of people and for the change that was going to take place within their system. It's become much better over time. Um, so we worked hard to make sure that the guests were welcomed, that every sponsor was supported. Um, so I'm just going to, that, that's just a brief introduction. I'm going to run through really quickly some slides that will be able to show you some of the um, the ways that we've helped, you've seen in the report sort of the, the things that we've, we've done, such as the, the checks and the monies. I'm going to run through a few, uh, a few stats and then just show you some photos and explain a few of the ways that we've supported over the last year. So if we could have uh, slide two, please. So, 
I'm sorry. I've, I, can, I can only see long distance without my glasses, but short distance with my glasses. So I'm going to have to keep doing that for this. <laughs> so, sorry, I can see this one better. So 604 visa applications were made in the Huntingdonshire area and we had 388 visa arrival statuses. So that means that 388 of those 604 people actually came to Huntingdonshire. So some of the reasons why they wouldn't have arrived would have been that lots of people made duplicates where the sponsor made the, the application and the guest did as well, or they did two because one took so long to, to, to happen. Um, and some people decided not to travel or they applied to more than one sponsor or they went to a different country. Um, so those 388 people went across 217 properties within Huntingdonshire. Some of those um, included accepting additional guests, so perhaps a partner that arrived um, a few months afterwards. And uh, 200 welfare visits have been completed 21 rematches, I'll talk about rematching, that's when we, uh, if somebody needs to be moved from a sponsor, we move them within the Homes for Ukraine system to another sponsor. And 17 individuals or families have actually gone back to Ukraine, various reasons. Some people wanted to go back, couldn't bear to be away from their families. Some people felt that it was now safe or went back to another part of Ukraine. 26 individuals or families have moved on to their own rented accommodation, which is a real success for us because that's our ultimate aim. Uh, one person, at the time of writing, one person had moved into social housing. We've got uh, two more moving within the next week, so that's starting to pick up now, which is fantastic. Uh, 177 home checks completed, four new babies born, including uh, a set of twin boys um, about three weeks ago, and nearly half a million pounds in thank you payments to our sponsors have been given. So that's kind of where we're, where we're at with numbers. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. So the next few are just a little bit a little bit quick. So we wanted to offer more than just the basics. You know, we've, we've got to do all of these checks, and there's nothing else that we are that we have to give people, apart from, you know, being at the end of a phone. We wanted to offer more value. Um, we wanted to galvanise support within the community to do this. So, honestly, it wasn't difficult to do that in the beginning. You know, there was very, very good feeling towards the people of Ukraine. Everybody wanted to help. Um, it was very positive. Um, we've tried to manage it really carefully as the months have gone by and support has become... Uh, less, and not because people have started to turn against anybody, just because naturally people lose interest as things leave the news. Um, but we wanted to make sure that in the beginning we galvanised all of that support and made sure we had somewhere that they felt safe and secure. So um, with a small group of volunteers and the generous support of Buckton Towers, we had our first social gathering. So the plan initially was to give sponsors a break. They've got new people living in their home 24-7, and it was one night in the week where they didn't have to cook for them. They could spend time with their family, and it was also an opportunity for the Ukrainian people to meet other Ukrainian people, um, to make friends, to network, and also to speak their own language, because they're all working so hard to speak English constantly. It's just, it was just a nice evening for them to be able to revert back and just have a bit of a breather. Um, meals were donated by local businesses. We had a, f a free shop with essential items and clothes. Um, it went really well and the Buckton Ukrainian support group was formed uh, from this meeting and it has been going on ever since, weekly, uh, weekly up until about three months ago, and now it's fortnightly. Um, uh, the the two-course meal ever since has been donated by local businesses, which is fantastic. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a slide showing, so Luke East heard about the weekly event. Uh, we were one of the few councils that were offering additional support to people in this way and offering social activities. Um, so they ran a live report on 
BBC Look East on, on one evening. And we used the opportunity not to focus on the council are doing this, but that the community are doing this. To, and we wanted to really encourage other people to get involved. Next slide, please. So, as I said in the beginning, it's really, really important to recognise all the work that the sponsors have been doing throughout this process. Um, so, we had our very first joint event. It was, again, at Buckton Towers. That was our, has always been our base for support, um, although it's grown since then. Um, we wanted to make sure they felt appreciated. So, ourselves, HDC, the Buckton Ukrainian Support Group, Hotel Chocolat, and Anne Furbank, which is a ladies' clothes shop in Buckton. Um, and many, many food outlets came together, and we were able to offer over 150 sponsors and guests the most amazing um, picnic. Um, if, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, a live band came and perfor uh, performed free of charge, and every child was given a bag full of chocolate, which was very exciting for them. The mums kept asking if they could have them. Um, it was just another chance to come together, also for me to be visible as the council representative. It's, um, I've always felt that it's really positive to be accessible to people. So everybody has my phone number, everybody has my email address, and I'm, I don't turn it off. Um, and I think to, I was um, bombarded with questions all night, and that was great for me because people felt comfortable and able to do that. And we were also, you know, I was able to point them in lots of other directions with lots of other people there at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. So since then, our aim has been to increase the offers that we give to people. So um, more than the basic support from us as HDC, uh, we've had uh, free shoes donated for all of the children last September in time to go back to school. We've had winter coats donated uh, by a local church for all children and young people and any adult that's small enough to fit into a teenage person's coat. There was Christmas gifts donated by Hemingford Hub for all of the children. Um, laptops and phones have been available through Cambridge Refugee Resettlement Campaign for anybody that needs them. We've been able, along with County and Stagecoach, to offer 10 free bus passes to every person that arrives, um, as well as free sporting classes and a lot more. Um, we don't shout about this because we don't, want to, we don't want any bad feeling within the community. And I appreciate that this is a lot of free stuff that's given to people when there's lots of people that are in need and possibly might not understand or and, and quite rightly feel a bit jealous of the things that another group of people are getting so although we want to give everything that we can we don't want any bad feeling within other parts of the community which is why you know it's not all over the news it's not in the local newspapers we don't want to shout about it too much um next slide please so councillor lara uh, davenport ray uh, who was a sponsor herself she arranged uh, a trip to some, for some of our guests to go down to Westminster. Um, it was a great, fantastically organised trip supported by one of our rail lines. Um, and our local MP, Jonathan Janogli, met everybody there, did a little talk, and then there was a, a tour. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and um, just moving on to this year then. So Ukrainian Christmas, for anyone that doesn't know, is on the 6th of January, not the 25th of December. Um, <clears throat> it could potentially have been a really sad or stressful or emotional day with most of our guests not having seen their husbands, their fathers, their extended family or their friends and also being away from um, their homeland and everything that they love and know. So we decided that we would put together an event uh, for anybody that wanted to go. Um, it was a chance to share culture, food, tra traditions. There was Ukrainian crafts there. There was Ukrainian um, ladies' choir. The Rotary Choir also sang. And it was just a lovely opportunity for our English sponsors or UK sponsors and our Ukrainian guests to come together and share something together to make it a really positive experience. And every single person that I spoke to that day 
was full of, I think you were there, weren't you? Really full of, of thanks and happiness that they were able to take their mind off what could have been a sad day and make it something much more positive. Next slide, please. So on to the important stuff now. What does our support in general look like? The two biggest needs on arrival for all of our Ukrainian guests are ESOL and jobs. So when they arrive, every single person, and I haven't met one person that hasn't wanted to yet, would like wants to learn English to a better level than what they have. Some people come and they're fairly fluent. Some people have come and they've not been able to speak a word of English. So it's really, really important that our resale offering is thorough. Um, so we, lo our local colleges, Cambridge Regional College, both in Cambridge and Huntingdon, offer free, Ukra uh, free English classes to all Ukrainian people on any of the schemes. The Open University also offers free English courses in speaking, listening, reading and writing. Um, we have weekly classes in person in places like Hartford and St. Ives. We have a fortnightly class in Buckton. And there's various other English courses that are run online and in person. As soon as we hear about them, um, we, let, we let the sponsors know and we let the guests know because we want them to succeed while they're here. And that is the number one thing that's also going to enable them to find a job as well. Many people are highly qualified. Um, and could get a job here and usually the barrier is that the language isn't good enough we have people that are, are lawyers that are nurses and we you know there's one lady i could think of in particular she's a lawyer and she could work here but it's it's that that technical language that she needs to learn her english is good but it's that technical lawyer speak that she needs to now so we work individually with people um everybody's an individual i nobody's sort of classed all together we work with them we're, we're quite lucky that we're able to do that because we have fairly small numbers in relation to some other areas um able to know everybody by sight and by name and to treat everybody independently um so it's difficult for a lot of people to get to classes for English, so it's really important to have those online offerings as well, so that they're able, and also a lot of people, it's confidence being in a new country, not wanting to travel too far. Um, as far as jobs go, we, we use our job clubs um, to tailor support. So everybody that's on Universal Credit will have a job coach, but our job clubs really help. Um, they, they've been really invaluable because they give that one-on-one -on -one assistance, they give time, they give people, um, they help them look for specific jobs, they will help write CVs, they will help um, make applications and, and just really boost their confidence. We also have a translator that is available for anybody whose English isn't great. There's jobs for anybody here, even if you don't speak English. We have people working in flower factories and all over the place. So it's not always necessarily that you can't get a job. It might just not be the job that you want. But then it's a starting point for everybody. Um, there's also skills training available. Um, so we work, we try and work as, as much as we can to build people's confidence, make sure that their CVs are up to date, that anything that needs to be translated in terms of like qualifications that they had in Ukraine, that we're able to translate them for them so that they're as prepared as they can be to enter the world of work. Um, I keep in good contact with sponsors via email. I, they usually get an email at least once, once a week from me about something, just making sure that the contact is always there. And we run uh, Teams meetings. In the very beginning, they were every fortnight, and everybody was at the same stage in the beginning. Now everybody is at a different stage. We have brand new sponsors, along with sponsors that have been doing it for a year and our old hats now. So we try and tailor our team's meetings. So one might be about moving on, one might be about employment, and people can dip in and out as they feel, um, feel the need. So we always keep uh, our future plans at the forefront, and we try and help guest plan for the future right from the very beginning. Many of them 
are going to settle here, whether they, that was their plan when they arrived or not. Um, so the steps that we take in order to help them do that is that we ask everybody to register with Homelink, which is the social housing register. Um, we do explain that the likelihood of getting a house in a short period of time is not likely, but it's always, always good to be on the list. And we've now had a handful of people that have been offered social housing, so it's starting to filter through, and that's fantastic. Um, next week, we have uh, somebody uh, new starting, so we've been able to employ uh, a young lady who is going, her, her sole responsibility is going to be to help people find uh, privately rented housing. So her job is going to be to um, act as an, a, a go-between between between the Ukrainian guests and uh, landlords and uh, private letting agents, all of that kind of thing. And they're going to negotiate prices, help them work out where they need to live, help work out what uh, what they can afford. Sometimes, you know, everyone wants to live in London, but if you don't have a London wage, it's not going to be possible. So, you know, but that reality check as well, saying, okay, this is what you can afford, and uh, and help them to negotiate prices and move it to be uh, to live independently. So, hopefully, that is going to be a real asset um, and really boost our numbers in terms of people being able to move into private rented accommodation. Um, we've also decided that a good use of our funding along is alongside the, um, the payments that our sponsors get from the government. So they get £350 a month from the government is to give them an additional £50 per person. Um, in these, t the, you know, cost of living crisis, all of everybody's bills going up. It's really difficult people to afford to make ends meet so offering that little bit extra if that means that a family can stay with the sponsor that's really really important to us <coughs> um, in terms of rematching um, in fact I, I was out delivering a, a family this morning to their new rematched sponsor um, relationships don't always work out between sponsors and guests in an ideal world you know you meet somebody online and you have a great conversation, you invite them to come and live with you and everyone lives happily ever after. Doesn't always work that way. Mo usually for nobody's fault, it's, you know, it might just be different ways of living. Um, sometimes it's just the, that the agree agreed sponsorship periods come to an end. Sometimes circumstances change. We've had sponsors where somebody's been made redundant and they physically, even with the additional payment, cannot afford to have somebody living with them. So if they're not in a position to move into their own uh, rented accommodation, rematching is our very first option, and it's the thing that we'll always, always ask people to look at first. Um, it's becoming more tricky. Sponsors have dwindled massively over the last few months. It's something that we're continuously trying to address. Um, but we will work tirelessly to make sure that a rematch is as seamless as possible. We want to make sure that the person um, doesn't have to move too far away from where they were living. Uh, quite often, they'll, they might have a job, children settled in school. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes we do have to move them to a completely different area because living in someone's home is better than living in temporary accommodation somewhere. So, and then by offering opportunities to socialise, work, learn English, signpost to support, um, to be available and approachable, hopefully they'll feel like they're fully supported and they have everything they need while they're here. We mustn't forget that they've left everything that they know and love in Ukraine. Their homes, jobs, husbands, fathers, brothers, friends, life. So it's really, really important to me that they're treated with respect, kindness and compassion. You'll be happy to know this is the last slide. <laughs> Thank you. So the future, what does it look like? Um, we're now in the second year of a war that, where there's no end in sight. I don't think any of us thought that this would be the case. I don't think the government thought that this would be the case when they set the scheme up initially. They've now extended the scheme um, 
sponsors now will be able to receive payments for two years rather than the one year that was initially set up. The amount that they receive as a thank you payment also goes up in year two. So it goes up from 350 to 500 pounds. Um, the funding has also changed. So in 2022, up until the 31st of December, uh, £10,500 per person was the allocation given. Um, from January this year, it went down to £5,900 per person. However, in being said that, and this, uh, the thank you payments are given to us in addition to that payment. So they're separate. It's a separate lump sum that's given to us by the government. Um, education receive money for every child that comes. So £3,000 per person for someone in early years, £6,580 per primary school child, and £8,755 for secondary school students. There's also, even though the amount of money we're going to receive has gone down, um, there's a new capital funding scheme that and I'm not an expert on this, so please don't ask me any questions on it. Um, if you have, I'll find out for you and come back to you. But what it does mean is that the government have recognised that housing is a massive issue in most areas. And we have been given funding to purchase 19 properties directly for Ukrainian guests. It also includes housing for the, the Afghan scheme, but that's something different. Um, as I said, the thank you payment has also gone up, and that's separate. So all in all, the funding that we're getting, uh, we're managing to stick well below uh, the, the budget that we have so far, which is fantastic. Um, there's also an additional pot of money available outside of all of this funding that helps guests move into their own privately rented accommodation. And this is money to buy things like white goods uh, to furnish properties that need to be done. And that's something that we can draw down upon as well. So although the funding's gone down, there's other pots of money that can build, build that back up. Um, we're always looking to share ESOL opportunities with people. We'll continue to do that and we'll continue to look at ways to make sure that there's more more classes available to people. We'll continue to support our guests in getting into the best work possible and available, including helping to upskill, transfer skills and documents relating to jobs that are the same or similar to what they did in Ukraine, and training, plus anything else that we can do to support. With the support of the new post, we hope to build good relations with letting agents and private landlords to give the best chance of them being able to access privately rented accommodation. We want to increase our sponsor pool. Uh, we need to be creative. We tried social media. That didn't work. We got some very negative comments when we advertised through social media. Um, it's not something that we want to attract. And I know that it's a few people that kind of make the most noise, but when it's something negative and it's something quite sensitive, we don't want to, we don't want to, um, to try and do that too often. At the moment, word of mouth seems like a good option. It's something, uh, because our sponsors have had such positive experiences, they're quite happy to tell all their friends and family about it. Um, we want to continue to rematch with as little stress as possible to our Ukrainian guests. We want to continue to organize and encourage community support, events and integration. We want to move from segregating. We want to keep, keep, the, keep the opportunities where they're on their own, but we also want to integrate them into clubs and, and groups where they're mixing with lots of other people. It will just make sure that they settle much quicker. Um, we're currently working to find the quickest and easiest way to purchase items for new homes. Um, this will be more frequent now more people are starting to move. We're trying to make sure that we have a quick way to purchase white goods, curtains, carpets, sofas, anything that people might need. So far, we've been able to, to manage more or less with donations. We know that that won't happen forever. And finally, we want to remain well within our budgets. We don't know when or how this will end. Um, so keeping, you know, making sure that we have contingency, making sure that um, 
we're not overspending is really, really important. And we've done, we've done really well at that so far. Um, so thank you very much. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you. Caroline, I just wanted to recognize the work that you guys have put in because I don't think anybody fully understands exactly what you've just described is happening. That's incredible. And I think you and your team really deserve a huge, huge round of applause because that's amazing. That's all I want to say. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It's, it's a huge... It was really hard to describe it in like 15 minutes, but it's, it, it's worth it. It's, you know, I, I, I've worked in community for lots and lots of years and it's the most fulfilling job that I've ever had. Councillor Bywater. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just to echo that, um, crikey, this, this happened under the previous administration when when uh, Putin decided to uh, uh, to start his uh, crazy um, efforts in Ukraine. Um, I just really want to say thank you very much because I described the way that you and the team have operated like a swan. You know, everybody's remained calm on the surface, but your feet and have been going like the clappers underneath. And I, and I really want to just touch on, you know, getting, I, getting some of these young people into education was a challenge. Uh, you know, liaising with the county council was hugely important. And ultimately, the welfare checks, you know, because I think that's crucially important in understanding where we're putting these people is crucial. You know, we've just talked about safeguarding in the previous paper. And, you know, so this has helped the district council uh, by doing the welfare checks. And um, just really want to say thank you very much. The only question I've got that came to me while we were looking at the presentation is you talked about contingencies um, a, a disclosure my brother's got a Ukrainian partner and family so you know this is quite close to me and I know they are very very grateful for what we've provided but we're talking about you know we've, we're sort of like 18 months into this process now and um, what sort of contingencies are coming over the horizon from you know you as management and the administration in relation to um, supporting them when you know, visa starts coming to the end of their tenure. You know, I think it's a two-year period, isn't it? And, uh, you know, what contingencies is the district council making to sort of manage that as it's coming over, potentially coming over the horizon? Because it will cause anxiety within the Ukrainian community if, you know, that's coming. So just how we're going to support that, really. Um, it's really hard to plan because we don't know whether... We don't know whether the government will continue to financially support. We don't know how long the war will go on. We don't know how many more people are going to want to come here. You know, the, the visa program is still open, so potentially 100 more people could arrive. Um, what we've tried to do is to do what we can within a minimal budget. We so, Some other districts went out and employed loads of people and employed partners to do a lot of things. We decided to go in the way of enlisting community support. We've spent very, very little in relation to lots of other districts, um, done a lot ourselves. And the plan moving forward is to continue what we're doing as long as we can. But I think because we've, we've built ways of supporting that don't cost money, and that don't impact on HDC so much or other organisations where, you know, time or money has a bearing, we'll be able to continue long into the future because we're not reliant on funding for a lot of the things that we do. Um, and we're running on skeleton staff, um, unlike some other places. I mean... I just, I just don't know. It's it's really difficult to to say.
you, you know, you summarise exactly what I was thinking, so I just wanted you to say it, really. Um, I, for, for Chair, if I, if I may, you know, th this is a situation that I think this committee should monitor. Um, whether we bring it back in 12 months' time, I think it would be suitable because it's coming over the horizon at some point. What that looks like, who, who knows, but I think it may be useful maybe to put this on the agenda in 12 months' time so we can look at it and support you as members. I think that's, that's crucial, really. Yes, I agree. I fully agree with you. On the back of your question, my question was going to be, what are your current problems you're facing and what are the problems you foresee in the future? Um, I'd say the number one problem at the moment is lack of sponsors. Um, rematching, so as, as we've we've uh, sort of come up to the first year of people being here. Lots of sponsors have had a fantastic experience, but they want their homes back. So we've, we've, re we've I mean, to be honest, we have no sponsors left in St. Neots, for example. Um, we have a few sponsors in outlying villages. I'm very, very loath to put people in somewhere where there's no public transport because all that does is it isolates them. They can't get work, they can't make friends, they can't go to clubs, they can't meet people. And what is that actually doing for their well-being and for them? It, it's not actually good for them to be put somewhere like that. So we, we've, been, we've, we've been begging people to, to sponsor. We've been using sponsors that have had a little bit of a break and we've managed to persuade them to go back to it. You know, well, not, not persuade them because they wouldn't do it if they didn't want to, but um, it's bec it, it is our biggest issue. Every time somebody says, oh, I need to be rematched, or the sponsor says, it's coming to an end and we can't extend, first of all, we say, but you get more money if you go into year two, and we try and make that like a really positive, good thing. Um, but there will come a time, it hasn't happened yet, there will come a time in the very near future where we won't be able to find a sponsor. And that's going to be an issue. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to echo my, the comments of my colleagues that, you know, what fantastic work you guys are doing. Um, and it's nice to see that you're getting a lot of support from the local communities. Um, and I particularly like that you call them guests. Uh, I think that's just a nice little touch. Um, did you get any, uh, you've probably sort of semi-answered this question already, but um, when you um, uh, increased the payments, did you see an uplift in sponsors? Presumably not from the, your comments, but. No, we didn't. Um, however, what it did do was potentially increase the amount of time that the current sponsors would sponsor for some we've we've got some sponsors that are in a really good financial position and money isn't an issue but we also have sponsors where money really is an issue and they're kind-hearted people that want to do something to help but they do need that financial assistance as well so that uplift in the payment had a big effect on them and I know for a fact that it's encouraged many of them to continue beyond what they would have been able to do initially. Um, yeah, it's a shame that there's the negative comments on social media as well, because, you know, in a cost of living crisis, that money could really help some families that are struggling. It'd be nice to advertise it and get more sponsors and, you know, help everybody out. Councillor Hunt. There we go. Cool. Just want to start again, just echoing my colleagues' comments. Thank you very much. You're doing an amazing job of this. And I'm aware how hard it is to summarize a year's worth of hard work into one presentation this evening, and you've done a brilliant job of that. I'm aware you've probably partially answered the first of my two questions here, kind of. Um, but, and I know you've said that we've built a lot of community support, and so funding isn't the kind of main thing that makes the scheme go around. But just a, um, conscious in my head, how long does HDC's current budget for the scheme go on for? How, how long have we got funds budgeted for, are you aware? 
So currently, um, it's per person that comes. So for every person that arrives, we've got we've had ten thousand five hundred pounds till the end of the year. We'll continue to get the five thousand nine hundred pounds per person, and that has to last for the two years that they're potentially living within the sponsor situation. Right. <clears throat> just for just for clarity, Chair, through you. Um, a, a previous uh, life, I was administering the House for Ukraine scheme at uh, at the County Council. Um, I think while the budget actually held by Huntingdonshire District Council um, may be of a finite size, there is some al unallocated resource at county level. Um, so uh, it doesn't mean that the, the, the reduction of the amount available per guest immediately translates into a financial difficulty for this council. And then if I can just ask a second question as well then. I know you said we don't know when government kind of funding is set to come to an end, but as a council, are we pushing the government to make sure that continues on into the future, just so we don't end up hitting a cliff edge? Um, I don't know. I personally, that would that's not something that I do, but I'm sure that higher up, it would be something that would be pushed for very much. Thank you. Yeah, under the council's sort of corporate plan, uh, do enable influence. I think that would fall very much into the influence category. Uh, and I think that reduction in funding is real um, in, in terms of uh, year two from the original 10,500, 11,500, 10,500. Um, having said that, some authorities have actually struggled to spend that quantum. And part of the reduction relates, I think, to the amount of expenditure. Predominantly, that expenditure, uh, in some part at least, was supposed to reflect pressure on services as well as supporting those individuals. And to some extent, and please feel free to get, to some extent, that pressure on services hasn't materialised in the way that I think it was first feared. Things like child and adult social care, for example. Councillor Orban. Through you, Chair. Um, Again, echo, echo colleagues' comments. I, I was sure, I just quickly looked through my email. There was one resident whose son, her and her son were wanting to host, and it was held up on the DBS check. And very quickly, I got the support I needed as a local member to help them put, put them in touch with, with the member of the, the appropriate council officer, and, and, and that was progress. So th thank you and your team for, for that. I'm also... Sort of take, quite taken with what you were saying about the sensitivities around helping people and not being able to help others. And I think my abiding thought is just because we can't help everyone, it doesn't mean we should help no one. And um, so I, th I think from the comments around the room, you've got the support of members that, that where we can offer help, we, we should do. The other thing I'd like to congratulate you and the team on is the approach that you've taken not just the practicalities of um, making the money stretch further, but the approach of engaging the community and getting community support. And I think one of the roles the council has, whatever the, the economy and whatever pressures are externally, is to be an enabler and to encourage, we used to talk about community resilience. And I, I think that's an important thing to, for the council to, to, um, to support. Two quick questions. On page 48, it refers to a visa application through Foundry, but doesn't give an explanation what Foundry is, if you could explain what that is. And uh, on a practical question, if someone comes here and decides partway through the first year they want to move to Ipswich or Peterborough or Milton Keynes to be with another family member, does the funding carry on for the whole year and it gets redistributed or does it stop the, the, the day they, they leave our authority and go to another authority and, and vice versa? So Foundry is the government system that was set up to record all of the visa applications. Uh, so it holds all of the information for our sponsors and for our guests. It shows the status of the visa application. Um, I mean, it's not great, but it shows in general whereabouts it is in the system, whether it's in the system, lost, 
or whether the, it's been issued, and it also states when they've arrived. Uh, it's also the place that we um, mark the checks that we need to do, so to make sure that the DBS is done. And the funding depends on us making sure that we mark that all of those checks have been done. And it's really important that we make sure that that's updated because that is the place that everything is stored. Um, it's the place that we um, rematch people where we sort of take somebody away from that sponsor and we mark that they've gone to another sponsor. If somebody moves out of the area, um, if they move, I think it, it's within a really short time scale to another area, they receive then the full, the full amount of the funding. Uh, if they've been here for six months and then they go there for six months, you can record that and it will be split. If they've been here for say eight months, and then they go, just go there for a couple of months, we would receive the whole amount of funding. So it depends how long they've been in one area before they move to another and how long they're going to stay in that area. Oh, sorry. So does that mean things balance themselves out over time between people moving between different authorities? And related to that, is there much movement between authorities or do you, when, when people get to an area do they tend to tend to stay? I think we've had about five people move into the area from another area. I would say in the cities, that's probably much a much larger uh, amount. Uh, l lots of people want to move to Cambridge. Everybody comes here and then says, can I move to Cambridge? And the answer is always obviously no, because they're under a lot of pressure as well. Everybody wants to live in London. Um, so the amount of people moving into this area isn't massive. And likewise, moving out because there's nowhere for them to go to within the system. Um, we have had a, a lady last week move to London um, for a job. Um, I'm trying to get her back because her sponsor is trying to charge her rent as well as receiving the payment and it's an extortionate amount. So, you know, we, we don't forget about people when they've moved either. We, you know, I keep in touch with everybody that moves on because just because they've left the scheme, they're still, you know, fairly vulnerable. They're new to this country. So we need to make sure that, yes, they've moved in, you know, moved to London or they've moved into their own private rented accommodation, but that doesn't mean that the support stops at that point. Um, you know, we're not gonna spend loads of money on them but they'll get if they want to ask a question we're there for them we can signpost them to way, other ways of helping they can still attend our social events just for a bit of information without embarrassing caroline further today after all the praise heaps upon her um, from my time at county i could see um, what different districts are doing in terms of foundry which is the case management system and as caroline said it's really important that that's completed appropriately not just for things like safeguarding checks uh, but also because it triggers payments from central government I can tell members that Huntington District Council, District Council certainly had the best performance of f updating and filling in the records on Foundry and therefore ensuring a, a flow of money to the county and then the district but much better than some of the other districts around. Has anyone got further questions or comments? Um, Councillor Shaw. Um, you mentioned you're struggling to find sponsors. Um, has there been any instance where, where you simply haven't got anywhere to put a family? Um... Uh, not yet, but I don't. I feel like it's not far off that happening. Um, it's difficult. We're, we're trying. <laughs> Caroline, I can see your heart is fully in this and you've gone above and beyond with your work. I'm just completely, I can't tell you how impressed I am by you. And I know the feedback I've had in St. Ives when I've spoken to the people in St. Ives, they speak so highly of you and I completely understand why, why, why they do now. I mean, your figures, your rematch figures are so low. It says so much about how well you're running this. So has anyone else got any more comments for Caroline? Oh, just thank you so much. We see how much you care.
So we've got, we'll note those comments that we've made and send them to cabinet. Okay, just for the minutes actually. This oh, one. just for the minutes, yeah. thank you. So finally, item six, the overview and scrutiny working program. I think Becky's got some update for us for future planning. Yes, so the, there's two things, just to update on the items that are already on the uh, program itself. Um, under the climate working group, there is a climate subgroup uh, looking at the electrical vehicle strategy. Um, I have been told that, that um, work is due to start on that very soon for the involvement of the working group. Um, and there is a meeting set up on the 18th of this month, uh, which would already been set up for this group. And they're going to come along to that to, to sort of discuss a bit further. So that will help start moving that along for us. Um, obviously, there's a couple of items there which will be coming to future meetings. Um, and just to add, the corporate plan, which has obviously now been adopted at the last full council meeting, whilst it's a bit soon for anything to have filtered through to us but between that adoption and this agenda being published, hopefully that will help to form, formulate some form of plan for us with, with some population for both the key decisions. And I'm also hoping perhaps a, a sort of 12 to 24 month working plan that we can see and, and see where we want to have some involvement. Um, I'm very much going to be asking for that to be ready in, in advance of the next meeting, certainly at the next meeting. I would hope that it's something I can circulate to you all beforehand um, so that we've got something that we can perhaps have some either email discussions or, or a separate informal meeting on to sort of see where we're at with the work programme side of things. Um, but certainly we should have something by the next meeting. Um, and, but just, just after that, is there anything that anybody wants to look at immediately that's not already covered um, or, or that's we know is coming up. Um, if there's anything to add, I think Councillor Harvey has something. Councillor Harvey, yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to see us do some work around mental health in the district, if that's possible. Councillor Shaw. Um, I don't know if it's within our remit, but um, I personally would like to see um, better support for members, for, for district councillors. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of the people in this room have had inquiries from residents and don't know where to find the answers to the questions or who to ask the questions. I didn't know if it's worth setting up a subcommittee or bringing it to here to brainstorm ideas, like um, expanding the intranet with more information um, or, or separate logins for the HTC website or something along those lines. Sorry, um, I think Councillor Alban might want to come in, but I'm, I was just going to jump in and say as well, there is a member development working group, which I think will address some of those issues. Um, there's also the signpost document, but I think I, I'll certainly make a note of that and see if there's some refresher information that we can send out now that everybody's had a year to find their feet, um, if we can send some refresher information out, thinking of, you know, we're just about a year in, but certainly it's something I will note it. And then if we feel that then that's not been substantial enough, then we can obviously revisit that at that point. Um, is, that, is that what you were going to say, Councillor Robin? Yes, it was. Yeah, it was lovely. Did you want to come back? Yeah, it's just, uh, it just, uh, just, it can just be an online resource, something, a, a flowchart. It could be a, a search, something we can search. You know, um, uh, you know, if you've got a tree-related inquiry or something, who do I email? Something, just something basic, just to, just to, you know, save us half an hour just trying to figure out who to contact. So. Councillor Hunt. You go. Two things from me. Firstly, having recently visited a brilliant youth group in um, uh, Huntingdon, along with Councillor Harvey, um, I was wondering if we'd be able to look into kind of partnerships we could have with youth organisations or any support we could offer those groups to see where they could need support and where we'd be able to help that. And um, secondly, I know everyone's been very busy, but um, I raised a lot about the possibility of the Great Fen Steering Group. I was just wondering if, um, just to make sure that's just noted down just for the future. It is, and I think so there's obviously that, that's an outside body in its own right. Um, but also I think, I, as I understood it, that this panel might like to have one of the summer meetings at that location. So I'm in early, early discussions to try and see if that could be possible. Potentially a summer one rather than it's, it's, yeah. it's a little bit in the middle of nowhere, um, conveniently rather near where I live. So yes, that's yeah. quite handy. So <laughs> I'm very up for that idea. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, Councillor Burke. Oh. 
try again. Um, this may come as no surprise, but the Burgess Hall, having spent some time at the weekend and see some of the sites that of the way the building has been left, the way it's not being managed, I think we need to explore that quite soon. Councillor Albain. Thank you, Chair. Just to pick up on Councillor Shaw's comments. Yeah, you know, pre pretty much that. Um, what, what Mr. Buddle said. Um, I think anything to go forward to that working group to look at council development. Um, Tony would, uh, would would welcome those those comments going going through. One of the things that did come up on um, on Tuesday night at the last meeting was, and, and it struck with me, is the importance of using the the call centre rather than just necessarily going to an officer we get on well with, because it gets it into the system. It's a bit like the police saying. Don't just go to a police officer, report it on the system, and, and that way trends can be tracked. So I, th I think it was a lesson, to, certainly to me, that just mentioning something to a particular officer might not get it picked across the bigger, the bigger district picture. Um, just on the climate change working group, you and I spoke at lunchtime, and it has been a frustration, I know, from some of, some of us particularly, and there's common support for the recognition of a climate change emergency that we've felt like we were twiddling our thumbs for longer than we needed to and we wanted to get on with it and I'm, I'm glad we're now able to, to do that. The Romans Edge lettings plan, if we could have an update on that because I think it, rather than just limited to Romans Edge, it does have wider repercussions across the, the district. And finally, on, on the Great Fen, because of not being able to stream a meeting there or the expense of setting up a separate streaming thing, maybe we could do a summer evening walk around that Councillor Bywater suggested and have that separately from a meeting and open it up to other members of the, of the, of, of the council and, and join us without thinking, oh, we've, we've, we've got to get on with it because we've got a meeting to go to. I think that would be a pleasant way. And if you make it around home Fen Woods, I can recommend the Admiral Wells, which is the lowest pub in the, in the UK in my, and happens to be in my ward. Right as well. <laughs> Other pubs are available, of course. Any further comments? Well, I thank you all for your contributions and your attendance this evening, and we'll close the meeting. Thank you.